Hi, Tisha. Hey, Donnie. And welcome, everyone, to Ursa Short Fiction, the podcast where we geek out on our favorite short stories. I'm Donnie Walton, author of The Final Revival of Opal and Nev. And I'm Disha Filia, author of The Secret Lives of Church Ladies. As always, this show is produced with support from you. Become an Ursa member today by going to ursastory.com slash join. You'll get exclusive bonus episodes and you'll help fund future stories and conversations. Today, we're thrilled to feature an audio story from Jocelyn Nicole Johnson's 2021 debut collection, My Monticello. The story is called Virginia Is Not Your Home. It's performed by January Lavoie and published by Macmillan Audio. If you like this story, there's also a link to the full audiobook in the show notes. Donnie, what can you tell us about this story without giving too much away? <laughs> I love this story. Okay, so Virginia Is Not Your Home is in the second person. It's a story about a dreamer whose name happens to be Virginia. And she's dreaming of getting as far away as possible from her birthplace at the beginning of the story. She describes her birthplace in this story as, quote, a nowhere hill tuck town. So <laughs> she manages to do that only to end up years later, for various reasons I won't spoil here, in a place she never imagined herself to be. And what I love about this story is that its form reflects what it's about, you know, how mm -hmm. years can rush past, especially for women who try to dream while also being mothers and wives, mm -hmm. etc. Yeah. So this story is in the present tense and told in summary. So it's able to kind of leap through time in this rush. So you get the sense that Virginia is asking herself by the end, how the hell did I get here? <laughs> Right. And we can add Virginia to our, you know, Ursa canon of messy women. <laughs> yes, I love it. After you've listened to this story, we'll be back next week with a conversation with Jocelyn Nicole Johnson. See you then. Virginia is not your home. Read for you by January Lavoy. They hung that name on you at birth, but Virginia was never your home. Read Nausea by Sartre and give yourself a new one. Trumpet your new name to the liver-spotted washroom mirror like a coronation. Gape your mouth, then angle your tongue behind your teeth. While you're at it, work to remedy those other afflictions. That fetid high hill R that has planted itself in the middle of words like wash. Scrub the stink of manure from your clothing and, while your young body churns over the basin, keep whispering your new, still secret name. Believe that if you can just change this, you can change everything. When your furtive girl body begins to unfold, pull your hair back so severely that the boys don't tug you down below the bleachers. Take to wearing father's faded stable flannels to ward off solicitations to a string of tissue paper dances. Don't accept it when they ask, who do you think you are? Whenever you test some sweet protracted word on your tongue. Don't accept the moldy hymnals, the marquee salvations, the wayward way that Mama courts heaven like a scornful lover. Don't ache too badly for milk cows in the pasture, their slick, contoured ribs pressing through. Take French, lock your doors, and trust in your own 16-year-old self. Fill out an array of applications, but don't tell Mama when you win a scholarship to an all-girls college toward the center of the state. Instead, let the screen door clap closed behind you. Feel brisk air rush by as you sprint barefoot through her hand-me-down fields. Run past the paddock, where your father attends to their cruelest horses, all the way to the muddy creek banks. As breath stings your lungs and a stitch claws up your ribcage, Howl victorious into the night sky. At freshman orientation, chew up and swallow the first name tag they give you. 
write yourself a new one. Someday soon you'll make it official, this new and chosen name. Smile with restraint so that no one can question the slant of your eye teeth, those hidden incisors, white as fresh milk, since, according to Mama, there was fluoride in the well water. According to Mama, she did not expect a dusky girl child like you, never mind father's complexion. According to Mama, nothing is promised in this world. Tell the other girls you've lost both of your parents when they ask why you didn't go home over Thanksgiving break. In the coming months, they'll invite you places, a cottage on the Cape, a brownstone in Georgetown for New Year's Eve. These young women who grouse over dining hall menus, who can't imagine divining supper from scraps. Take note of the weight of their family silver, the briskness of their black butler's hands, cuffed in starched white. Take note of the line of first edition books along their parents' mantles. Read Camus and Kafka to tatters. Read Simone de Beauvoir. Work harder still, and as soon as you are able, transfer to a bigger school, one with a better language department. Don't fret that it still sits in your namesake state, Virginia, or Ginny, like your one sweet-faced grade school friend used to call you. Those girls you grew up with, who preened in pickup headlights, who got themselves knocked up then abandoned before they reached legal drinking age. Study your new suburban sweet mates, but don't follow them to their beer-soaked parties. Instead, take a greyhound to a protest near the White House. Lead a chant against the bombs being dropped in a desert you can't properly name. Shake your fists at those suited, greedy men determined to devour the world before you even taste it. Work double shifts weekends at the rural country club on the outskirts of your Blue Ridge College town. The steep, winding bike rides make you feel like you've hardly left the place that reared you. Shuttle trays to large round tables, gin and tonics, jumbo shrimp cocktails, chicken cordon bleus. Ancient couples shift in three-piece suits and gowns glinting with costume jewelry. All that pomp against your black v-neck sweaters and second-skin leggings, your hair always coming undone around your face. The men ogle your cleavage. A few pinch your bottom, saying, Smile, why don't you? Watch how, as soon as their wives turn away, they circle back to lay more money on your table. Save every goddamn penny and buy a plane ticket to Europe. Ride the trains from Firenze to Prague, from Prague to Munich. Tell yourself, I am here, I am here, like a song. Tell yourself here are history and culture and power. Here are the old writers who wrote books that you believe saved you. Here you are with your notebook outside a cafe. If you hold your mouth right, you feel like you nearly belong. Never mind that the cobblestones underfoot recall your steep and rutted driveway, that the hostel's duvets summon Mama's mildewed quilts. Bolt upright in the sleeping carriage at the knock in the night as your train crosses yet another border. Curt foreign voices demand passaport. Hand over your full and legal name. Outside a discotheque in Paris, lean into a striking, dark-haired man. He whispers your chosen name to you, his accent making it new again. When he asks where you're from, list a string of cities you hope to soon visit. Tell him London. Tell him Barcelona. Tell him Tangier. Hurry back to his place and allow him to take you. A satisfying shock, like diving into spring water. Call out a strand of inelegant errs, followed by a sob of release. Turn your head. Catch the eye of another man, less beautiful but an artist, a photographer, and from a good French family. Don't go to bed with this second man right away. Stay with him in his family's sprawling flat in the city, rooms framed by velvet curtains, arranged under dusty chandeliers, Stay with him well past your flight, forfeiting your final fall semester. Promise yourself you'll go back and graduate in the spring.
When this man questions you about the states, answer him as if America is a dream you are still dreaming. Close your eyes and conjure vast open spaces and sleepy small towns. Summon cities for him, bar-lined streets, smoky stages raising men with skin as brown as your father's, their bodies curled over snares or saxophones. Speak to this man in French of art and ambition, those foreign words rattling around in your neediest places. Flash him your crooked eye teeth and hope he sees what you mean to show. Marry this man in nine months' time, a tiny secular ceremony back at your parents' home. The animals have been sold off or buried, but there's still one near-level field. Tell yourself it's only a handful of days. It makes sense that your husband-to-be needed to see this place. Don't tremble inside those peeling paint walls as you hear father's lone voice echo in the darkened hallway. Don't startle when Mama lays a tattered family Bible in your hands. Silver photos chafe between yellowed pages, your own stark and shining maternal ancestors whose lives ended here where yours began. Your parents look older than their years, their faces creased and furrowed. They refrain from using your new name, but also hold the old one deep in their throats. Let the girl from Mama's church scatter petals on the ground. Let Father march you down the grassy aisle, solemn in a dark suit and boots buffed to glossy. Feel how he clutches your powdery shoulder as if to share something through the press of his thumb. Your new husband seems to find all of it charming, even the new A&P in town, even Mama's cola-soaked ham. As you walk with him along the muddy bank, he mimics the way your father says crick for creek. Rent a place near D.C., just outside the Beltway. A posh agency there wants to represent your husband's work. Tell yourself it will be six months more in Virginia, a year at most. Your husband photographs looming constructions, bridges, facades. He's out the door before the light breaks to brilliance, and he works through sunset when the day is nearly gold again. Metro to Foggy Bottom, to DuPont Circle. Step through the automated doors, escalating up into swampy summer heat. Don't bristle at the homeless woman near the exit, whose moony face reminds you of your mother if Mama were dirt-lined and liberated. Don't stare at your server at the tea house with her closely cropped hair and ebony skin, though her eyes hang on you for a moment too long. Come winter, metro to the National Mall emptied of tourists. There you are, a bright dot of a woman alone in a wide gray landscape. Peel off your red gloves, blow heat into your pinkened palms. Scrawl something you remember of your one time in Europe, a story you hope of a girl who got away. Come spring, dredge yourself from a nightmare of sinking to find yourself unaccountably seasick. Your husband is away in Rome, photographing famous ruins. Accept that this is your fault, after all these years of brutal care. You've been reckless in the ways you've wanted, as if there was no end to want. As if the hungry burden of your husband's foreign body could free you from your own. Motherhood presents itself as a dull ache at your center. Your husband sounds ecstatic on the phone. He'll be home in five days, seven at the most. Hang up and call Mama, who gets to sobbing. From joy? From grief? Eat unrolled ho-hos and fried, thick-cut bologna. Don't ask yourself, where am I headed now? Abandon yourself to wrenching labor, break open, and birth a son. Eighteen months later, carry a girl, a daughter. Choose your son's name, a clever French one, but let your husband name the girl. It sounds like a fine name the way he first says it, though your daughter soon plucks a nickname from it, perky and provincial. Your husband's career continues to lift, his vivid seascapes lining gallery walls. While his agency flies him all over the world, you are tasked 
to stay behind and raise the children. Dig your nails deep into your thighs each night, but never let the inky bruises show. Let your husband buy you a house in the suburbs, an outpost from which to raise these fair and fitful beings. Whenever he's home, petition him still. Tell him you could live in Bordeaux or Brussels. Tell him you would live in Madrid. Never mind that already you know his stock answer, that the money is better working from the States. Insist on a long trip to Europe each summer, though it reminds you of how big the world remains. Stay near La Rochelle, not far from the water, where your husband's mother now lives. His mother, who maintains that your wedding was trop loin, who dresses in crisp linen and plants dry kisses on the children's cheeks. The whole time you've known her, she's kept the same servant, a North African lady who cleans and cooks and shops like a wife. When you glimpse this second serf of a woman, feel outraged and full of envy. Those early years are trying. Persist. The children beg you to play on hands and knees. The children run screaming to greet their father whenever he bursts through the front door. Notice the lavish way he lifts them with only a weary peck on the cheek left for you. Jet-lagged, he collapses on the king-sized bed, leaving luggage for you to unpack. Much later, you wake to the light of his cell phone, its blue glow in his eyes, and your shared bed lurching to his needy rhythms. Let yourself feel something, too, a pulsing sadness, a lumen of want. Even though before you can whisper his name, he emits a shuddering groan that gives way to snoring. Notice how quickly the years are unfurling. The children double, then triple themselves. The boy is five, the girl is ten, the boy is fifteen. Your husband's gone bald. Still, women swoon at his stubbled jaw and muscled chest. You hear him outside, cursing softly to himself below your open bedroom window. That same morning, you find a stack at the back of the closet, old forgotten journals full of your eager, awful words. Gawk at those futile, straying stories, and don't pick up the phone when it rings. Mama's voice lifts up out of the machine to tell you your father has passed. You feel numb and at the same time untethered, as if an invisible cord that anchored you has now been let go. After the funeral, at the stop sign in town, your husband palms your stockinged knee. Believe he is consoling you even when he says, Shall we consider moving here? For your mother's sake. Promise yourself you'll never move back, but take Mama's calls every night. Each small thing she says makes its own kind of sense, but taken all together, they sound outlandish. Your husband has been home for six weeks in a row, his unflagging presence setting all of your routines askew. Turn away when he mentions moving in with your mother, though he makes it sound like a high-wire trick that might well save you. See how he sidesteps talk of his dwindling work, the partial mortgage payments, the growing distances between you. Put the house on the market, just to see what it will bring. What else can you do? Accept the highest middling bid, and let your husband call this freedom. Your son, tall as you, makes fists when you tell him. His mouth twists as if he holds kindling inside it. Your daughter slams her bedroom door, leaving you outside of its dry rattle. Press your ear to hear her mule on the phone to a middle school boyfriend, a person you'll never meet. Those first weeks back are trying. Hold on. The old rambling house is a circus, and Mama's confusion a grotesque new exhibit. See how she stumbles over the children's names, how she acts like a child herself some days. One bleak winter night, she wanders off, though you don't realize she's missing till the corded phone in the kitchen blares. Some city-sounding couple is on the line. They must have bought your old neighbor's place. Race down and find Mama in your car's searching headlights, alone in a grove of pine. A flood of relief. Your own shrinking mother, 
caped in a mossy quilt and spinning, your son's filthy sneakers like rank mittens on her hands. Move Mama into a nursing home and visit every day, even though whenever you walk in, her body seizes with agitation. Take a break. Don't go back. One day, then another, until a week has passed. That first time you return, Mama grasps the arm of a passing staff member. You hear Mama beg this uniformed stranger to tell her who in the world you are. Your husband accepts sporadic assignments up and down the coast. He drives to Lexington, to Front Royal, leaving you carless and stranded. He shoots portraits and street fairs and weddings, all of it intimate, fleeting. Eventually, he packs his cameras away, reminding you he's always loved jazz music. He uses the last of your savings to open a boutique record store in a strip mall in town. The children attend your old high school, classrooms from which you once plotted escape. Each day they grow less tied to you, leaving longer swaths of your days free. One rainy spring morning, after dropping off your husband, you collect a rustling stack of applications. Tell yourself they are for your daughter, but never show them to her. What could you do here with no real qualifications, not even having finished your degree? Could you be a clerk? A secretary? Could you wait tables again? Mulch Mama's feral azaleas. Resurrect the kitchen garden that fed you as a child. Fashion raised beds from the railroad ties you find abandoned behind the shed. Eat lunch on the side porch, white bread with sliced tomatoes, your native hair loosed and scraping your shoulders, your face turned to the breeze. The next time you visit the nursing home, Mama flies up in her wheelchair. She clutches you with such ferocity, it feels like you've only just met this woman who raised you. There are letters, she tells you, in the house. Letters your lonesome and stoic father once penned to you. Promise me you'll find them, Mama says, still squeezing. Hold her cloudy gaze. Let her warm breath fog your face. Rifle through drawers, overturn crates, leave everything gaping and churned. After days of fruitless searching, admit to yourself that you want to believe. Read in bed by ochre lamplight of glaciers liquefying and waves of refugees breaching Europe. When your husband asks what's the matter with you, let your old wounds gleam. Look at him and plead, take me away, though you don't know where there is to go exactly. Your husband answers you in French, so quickly you can't catch the words. When you ask him to repeat himself, he reaches over and past you. With one sharp click, he pitches the room to black. After you and your husband separate for good, fill out each application. Without central hiring and background checks, your legal name is required here again. All this time you promised yourself you'd change it, and now it feels too late. As you hurry out of the new super Walmart, don't dwell on the line of accented girls working three registers in a row. Did they come from Ethiopia? From Egypt? How did they end up belonging better than you in your nowhere hill-tucked town? Balance heavy bags of groceries in the crooks of your arms and pinch yourself to keep from crying. Your nearly grown children sleepwalk beside you, the girl a sophomore, the boy a senior slated to leave soon for college out of state. Their eyes remain pinned to the cell phones they hold, of which you don't approve. These devices were given to them by their father to keep in touch now that he's moved back to Europe. Keep moving and look straight ahead when you hear someone call after you, Virginia, Virginia. The voice draws nearer even as you quicken your pace. Ginny, I can't believe you're here. Feel red heat spread across your chest. Here is a girl you used to know, her face flushed and pretty still, though swollen with age. Let your body twist. Let your arms fly up, even as your grocery bags fall to your feet with a clatter. 
Lunge in and holler as loud as you can. Virginia's not my fucking name. Roar into the glassy face of the grandchild this woman holds and tries to shield. Take in an endless, jagged breath, then tug the arms of your own wayward offspring. Slam the car doors shut and swerve away to a stench of burning oil. Take in the tableau in the rearview mirror. Gaping mouths, your daughter's eyes welling, and all those lost groceries which you can hardly afford to replace. Know that they are real, and you will soon find them. Your father's letters. You'll unearth them in an antique chest, varnished in mold, that his own people gave to him. Each letter will speak of dull and dogged yearning. Each one will be hand-addressed to you. Virginia, you'll confess to the foggy washroom mirror, your reflection thicker, age spots blooming on the backs of your hands. You'll look hard and wonder how the time passed so swiftly, how your mark on the world remains so shallow. Tell yourself you can start again. There is still time. This time, you'll trek a high pass in Asia. You'll sail to Antarctica to witness the great ice caps weeping. This time, you'll fly to Africa to follow the last wild elephant's run. You've read they have a secret language, sonographic as whale song. You'll sing them a dirge and kiss the dust. Lay a humble ear to the ground and listen.